Welcome to StartupRad.io, your podcast and YouTube blog covering the German startup scene with news, interviews, and live events. Hello and welcome, everybody. This is Joe from StartupRad.io, your startup podcast and YouTube blog from Germany, bringing you again another interview in our series with Invest in Hessen. If you want to learn more about them, check out the link in our show notes or go dub 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 invest minus in minus hessen.com where you can learn more. Today, I would like to welcome David here in our interview. Hey, how are you doing? Hi, Joe. How's it going? I'm uh, doing good. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I just got uh, tested negative last week. So after being in quarantine for nearly one and a half weeks, so I'm glad to be back, but still at home. I would assume that felt a little bit strange, but nonetheless, we're very happy to have you here. You are here because you're the founder and managing partner at Qualifies, but we'll soon get into that. I was, again, looking a little bit at your profile, and I saw that you did quite a lot of interesting stuff. You did, for example, a bachelor's degree at the University of Maastricht in Netherlands. You attended the University of Singapore, Universita Bocconi, Technical University Darmstadt, and finally Rotterdam School of Management again in the Netherlands. So you have quite seen so a bit. Which places did you like most? So um, I guess uh, for every student, I guess the exchange semesters are always the most exciting ones. And I did two exchange semesters, which were indeed, as you mentioned, in Singapore and in Milan at Bocconi University. And I would say uh, the one in Singapore probably was one of the most fun six months uh, I've ever had in my life in terms of traveling, meeting new people, meeting different cultures. Uh, so I would say that was probably the most fun one. I also love Singapore not only for the Formula One race, which I attended once in person, but also f for the mix of Indian, Chinese and uh, Southeast Asian culture, the hawker centers, where you can get almost like every imaginable food. It's really awesome. Plus, it really never gets cold in the city. I asked a friend who grew up there, uh, does it really get cold? And he was getting close and said, during monsoon, you know, at night, it can get below 20 degrees Celsius. <laughs> Yeah, I think exactly. I think weather is good. Plus, it's a great hub in terms of traveling because you can basically go to everywhere in Southeast Asia within a couple of uh, hours flight. So uh, I would add that on top. Yeah, for the metric hating Americans, that's 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So it, it barely gets below that. It's, it's a really nice place and pretty close to the uh, equator. And you've seen quite a bit in terms of companies, established companies, I do believe. You've been with Rothschild as an intern. You have been at BASF. I think most people would not know them. It's one of the largest chemical companies in the world. And they're headquartered, I would say, something like 45 minutes to an hour to the southwest of Frankfurt. What did you learn there and how did it leave an impression on your life? Yes. So first up front, so I always uh, wanted to become a banker. So at least that was the plan, especially when, while I was studying. So I focused a lot also on that while I was studying, did extra courses, etc. Then I actually got first peaks into investment banking. So at JP Morgan in London and also at Rothschild in Frankfurt. And even though I really appreciated the size of the deals that you work on, the spirit, etc., I believe the working hours were actually indeed crazy and that actually led me then to decide, okay, maybe banking is not the right thing for me. So I decided how the hell do I get out of it because I've always spent most of my internships in like the PwC, smaller banks, bigger banks. So it was a bit hard to actually find an alternative afterwards because I a little bit had the finance stamp on myself. So I thought one way how to get out of it is actually to do a master's degree, which is a bit broader, not focused on finance and also to do an internship at a company that is not related with finance. And that was actually BSF. And I worked on a corporate finance project at BSF, where we basically looked at uh, acquiring um, a small company. And I basically did the, the analysis on the deal rationale, the valuation, etc. So for me, my internships have really been a bit the path of finding out what do I like, what don't I like. And eventually then I ended up uh, in consulting at McKinsey. So, But that's a bit on the story behind. 
Yeah, d don't worry. We get to this step. So uh, for a little bit over three years, you've been a consultant there because I was wondering, you've always been in banking, like transaction-oriented consulting and stuff like this. Then you have been with BASF. Then you have been a consultant. And then you started what is today qualifies. I do believe it was at this time called Chem Square. And how did this happen? Where did you find your interest for supply chains, for chemical industry? How did this happen? Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, yeah, indeed, the company was called Chem Square before. And basically, uh, during my time at McKinsey, I worked a lot on uh, private equity um, portfolio companies, so many restructurings. At McKinsey, you always have the chance to do a PhD or MBA in Germany, and I opted for the PhD option. So I did my PhD at the Technical University of Darmstadt. And what I looked at during my PhD was user behavior on digital platforms. How can you like, increase certain transaction rates, conversion rates, etc.? And while I figured that there was plenty of stuff already in B2C, B2B was very much uncovered yet from a research perspective. So I decided it might make sense to look into B2B startups. And to be honest, I didn't find that many. That was in 2016, roughly, at least not that many in Europe or in Germany. And one very big example that I found was Klöckner. It's a steel trading company in Germany with uh, several billion revenues. And they were basically all over the press because they were digitalizing uh, steel trading, basically. And uh, the reason why I decided doing this, amongst others, because was steel was a commodity and prices were dropping because there was an oversupply in China. And I actually remembered from my internship at BSF that in chemicals, you also have commodity chemicals and specialty chemicals. So I thought, if this guy is doing it with steel trading, why can't I do this with chemicals trading? And that's basically how the idea was born to found ChemSquare to build a digital platform to buy and sell chemicals online. And so in 2017, basically, I left McKinsey while I was still doing my PhD. The PhD is finally now completed, but I think only last year. So actually, it, I dragged it a bit uh, w w when I basically left McKinsey. Uh, but that's uh, the history behind ChemSquare. And then in 2018, basically, we figured that what we planned didn't work. And then we basically pivoted our business model. And since 2019, working on what we call today qualifies. So that's the story behind it. Yes, I've seen you basically started uh, the company, what is today qualifies around that time. And I was actually surprised why you opted for the chemical industry. Can you give us some information on that? Plus, I would be very interested how you figured out Chem Square would not work and how you decided to actually pivot and in what direction that would be some important decision I would like to learn more about. Yeah. So as I said, I was inspired by Klöckner, the steel trading company, and it worked in steel, or at least there was this perception at that time, uh, was because steel was a commodity. Uh, it's quite a big market. It's a commodity, uh, which means price matters a lot. And when price comes into play, it's a lot about comparison, a uh, very fragmented market, etc., so that was basically one element that I found very appealing in the steel industry. And you could also find this very similar structure also in the chemical industry, where you have many chemical distribution companies, many commodities, highly fragmented, but still very big market. And basically, uh, yeah, I think the notion is very clear that B2C and B2B buying behaviors tend to converge. So that was also our hypothesis at that time. So I decided at that time to build a company where you can buy and sell uh, commodity chemicals online, so a B2B platform. And I thought it was going to be sufficient to start with a simple price comparison engine and basically who delivers what and uh, to, for what price. I think the idea was still good and probably it still is. But what we then learned uh, along the way, and I have to say, I don't have a chemical background and neither did my co-founder or does my co-founder have, Florin, who basically joined a couple of months after I founded ChemSquare. He was actually the executive assistant, basically, of the CEO of Klöckner. So it's actually a funny story because when I launched ChemSquare, I reached out to the CEO of Klöckner and said, look, what you're doing in steel, I'm going to do in chemicals. Don't you want to invest? And then basically he sent his chief of staff to test myself and the investment hypothesis. And then we met up in a hotel in Frankfurt. We had a couple of beers and then decided that we were going to be doing this simply together. And that's how Florian, how I met my co-founder. So <laughs> I would be curious how the CEO reacted and if they invested. <laughs> yes. So uh, I can answer the second question. He didn't invest. I think you can imagine the first part. <laughs> 
That is quite a good story. You, 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 somebody got sent to vet your company for an investment and you actually hire, uh, you get this person as co-founder. Yeah, that makes quite sense. <laughs> that was a good one. And uh, you guys then got into collecting investments. Did you get some investments before you pivoted or after? Yeah, so actually we did get a couple of investments before we pivoted. So as I said, like I launched uh, Camp Square in 2017, early 2018, Florian joined. And during 2018, it was basically a journey of fundraising and also trying to figure out how to get our business model running, and which we didn't eventually. So we succeeded in the fundraising part. We didn't succeed in the business model part. I think the reason why we still managed to get in capital, because people especially believed also in us as a team, so in Florian and myself, and they figured that if this doesn't work, they will find figure out a way how to make it work. And you also asked why it didn't work. So basically a couple of reasons maybe to that. So one element was that we thought price comparison was going to cut it, but actually the chemical distribution is much more complex and price is just one element. So basically they typically, they you need to offer certain services like insurance, like logistics. So like just the price advantage is not enough of, an, um, of a value add in order to really change suppliers on a very frequent basis because you also have long-term contracts, etc. Then another element was that you really need to integrate into the B2B procurement systems because if you do not do this, then whoever is buying and selling the chemicals online needs to enter all the data on your platform and then also in their own systems, which causes duplication and is also additional work. Plus, uh, at that time, many large chemical manufacturers were planning to launch their own chemical e-commerce shops, basically, to sell directly to their customers and basically circumvent the distribution companies. So there was also a certain reluctance to join these kind of platforms because everybody was looking at them in terms of like, this is going to change everything. Like, And so I think these were the reasons why it didn't work. We then did a quite extensive workshop with many of our customers who actually also bought some of the chemical raw materials, but mainly in, in the life science industry, so food pharma. And then we asked them like, in hindsight, from a product point of view, very stupid question, but why aren't you not using the platform? And then like, why are you not using our solution? Why is it so hard to get started? And basically then a discussion started among our clients in the workshop. And the discussion was not about procurement, but was actually about supplier qualification, about not being able to just change from one supplier to another because there's, a, there's tons of documents that you need to take care of in order to switch from one supplier to another. And especially in the pharmaceutical industry, and there's regulation that says that you cannot just use a supplier just like that, but you have to register the supplier at the authorities when you, list, when you want to sell a certain drug in a certain market. And as part of this document package that you need to send to the authorities, you also need to show that you have audited the supplier, which means that you've physically inspected the supplier to make sure that whatever he's selling to you, that he has been manufacturing it under certain rules and regulations, which are described by the US FDA or by the European EMA. And so we thought if we fix this problem, if we fix the supplier problem, a supplier qualification topic, then we would get the marketplace running. So we started in 2019 with a supplier qualification platform focusing on supplier audits in the pharmaceutical industry. Then we actually figured that this was a business completely on its own and we've been doing this ever since. I see. I would be a little bit curious about the conversation you had with the co-founder Florian. Florian, this is not going to work, but I do believe our clients just gave us a new business model. Was it something like that? No, actually. So I would say the, the ride was uh, equally tough for both of us. So we were both sitting on the phone, really calling hundreds of uh, customers in the industry and trying to sell them our product or basically uh, offering them that we could organize any chemicals at a very cheap price. And that's what we tried. And we already there, we noticed that the feedback wasn't too great. So it wasn't a big of a surprise. It was more like a steady process where we both came to the conclusion this is not working. We don't know what is what's going to be working. So we were very open with our investors and we said, look, we have like one more shot. And we did one last funding round where the investors also said, we trust in you. But if we want to go the way this road with you, like which is more uncertain than before, then you also need to restructure the team. You need to reduce your burn rate, etc. So that was actually very tough in 2018 because we hired good people, Florian and myself. And within the first couple of months, we basically had to let them go again because we realized that what we were building wasn't really working and that we actually had to take a step back, reassess our product market fit and then build a team around that and not like build a team and then see what they were going to be building because we couldn't afford that. So that was actually very tough because we hired people and had to let them go shortly thereafter. That was very fast personally, I would say very memorable, couple of memorable weeks because it was super tough for us. 
But funny enough, one person who we actually decided to let go at that point in time because we couldn't hold them, the person actually rejoined qualifies a couple of months back. So I would say there's hopefully no more hard feelings. Those were very tough times 2018. <laughs> But now those tough times are hopefully behind you forever. We will see. And I would be curious, can you explain a little bit the problem in quality control in pharma and the chemical industry? I don't have a chemical background, but the worst case is people can get sick, they can die, or factories even can go boom. Exactly. Yeah. So eventually, so what we focus on, as I said, is the pharmaceutical industry. And so how it works today is if you're a drug manufacturer like Stada, Novartis, if you're selling your drugs in the pharmacy, if you want to sell them, you need approval from regulatory authorities that you can sell that particular drug in the market. And of course, the reason why there's regulation is because if a drug doesn't work, The worst thing that can happen is that you die. So there's obviously very strict regulation that describes how drugs need to be manufactured, but not just how the drug itself needs to be manufactured, but also how the ingredients that are used to manufacture this drug, how these ingredients need to be manufactured. And um, now politics are talking a lot about the European Supply Chain Act, where companies are basically will be forced uh, potentially to make sure that their suppliers stick to certain rules and it will not be simply sufficient to believe what the supplier is telling you but that you actually have to verify it somehow and the pharmaceutical industry recognizes already 20 years that like pure certifications etc or relying on what somebody's telling you is not enough but they impose a regulation that forces drug manufacturers to audit their suppliers on a regular basis so it's up to their responsibility to see if the products that they buy from their suppliers correspond to certain quality requirements and as you can imagine Many of the suppliers are based, for example, in Asia. The supply chains are quite international, quite big, very complex, which means that if pharmaceutical companies, they want to assess their whole supply chain or audit their whole supply chain, it's quite a cumbersome process. It's a very critical one, but it's also a very expensive one because companies need to send their own people physically to the supplier site to then walk around the supplier's factories and production sites, write an audit report, then they fly back. And this often takes uh, up to five days of total work, writing the report, flying back, flying forth, uh, being on site for a couple of days, preparing the audit. So we figured that this was quite a big problem for the industry. Not a problem, but like very cumbersome and expensive process. And what we learned along the way is that many pharmaceutical companies, they use the same supplier. And they also apply the same kind of audit framework uh, when they audit the suppliers, which means they all check for very similar information, but the data was not really shared before. So what we thought at that time was a very good idea is if we collect the data once through a good auditor and then we own the data of that supplier, then we can just sell that kind of data to the different pharmaceutical companies that buy from that supplier. We can help the companies get this uh, regulatory data in a fast and efficient and cheap way, while at the same time helping the suppliers reduce the number of on-site audits by, from their customers, which is a big pain to them, right? Uh, because it's, it takes it's very time-consuming to host all these customer audits. And that's basically how Qualifies then uh, was born. So basically, we collect data through audits, and then we resell that data to the pharmaceutical companies of the suppliers. When I was reading this at first, I also had the impression you sent your own people there. And that can be very expensive because if they have to fly business class to Asia, fly back and never forget the jet lag, it's if you have to you do that on a regular basis, I do believe the fun stops pretty soon. Plus, I was wondering, can you also do like send an external auditing company there or is it so specific that your people have to do it? Is there something that you are required to do it in person? Yeah. So uh, basically today the regulation says that you should unless, for example, like COVID comes in, but typically you always try to be on site, which means that this is something that you cannot uh, digitize, for example, right? The person will always need to be on site. But of course, you can ask the question who needs to be on site and where's the person coming from? And we very early on said that if we want to get this very big, we're not going to be able to scale by hiring every single auditor there is in the world in all the different countries because the suppliers that we audit they're scattered around across Asia, China, India, the US, of course, everywhere around Europe. So it wouldn't make sense to hire everybody. So we relied very early on independent auditors where we have a very extensive uh, qualification process. But once they qualify for us, they can basically do the audits in their respective countries. So we have auditors who are based in China, who audit Chinese suppliers, and the same goes for the US and for the different European countries, which means that we can be on site. The auditors, they know the culture, 
So they know the environment, they might even know the supplier, they know the language, they don't need to travel that far. So the cost advantage was also a cultural advantage that we basically have. And that, of course, helped us a lot during Corona when many companies couldn't travel, where they couldn't send their own staff around the world and we were already present. So basically, we could just do the audits uh, on site for them. And that was a huge help for the pharmaceutical industry. I totally believe that. So basically, you are getting from a marketplace where you can deal in chemical ingredients, I would say, to a place where you can deal in audits of chemical companies as chemical suppliers. Would, would that be about right? Yes, exactly. So uh, often these materials which are procured by pharma companies, they're eventually their chemicals. So that's true. So exactly right. So we don't just deal with the, the audit but rather with the data that we collect at the suppliers. So it's highly confidential data. And I think, the, so the good part is, or let me put it differently. So today, there's tons of data around in the world. You can find data publicly. Uh, companies will, you can send them questionnaires. They will explain to you how they're doing things. So they, they're willing to share data on their own. The problem is, how can companies decide which data they can eventually really trust of any kind of data that is out there in the market, both that is supplied by suppliers or that you can find publicly. And what we basically do is we actually go on site and collect the data independently so that customers can be sure or assured that the data that we provide has really been verified by us independently and with our own eyes on site, right? So there's no, it's very hard to fake that kind of data. And so basically, I would say we've shifted from a procurement platform to a data player, basically. But to keep in mind, of course, the suppliers, they need to accept that we share the data with their customers. So we cannot just like randomly sell the data, but they need to approve it. But it's always in their interest as long as they know the customer, because of course, for them, if they approve us sharing the data, it automatically means fewer customer visits on site, which is also in their interest, at least to a certain extent. And maybe even more potential customers. I would be, since I don't have a big understanding of what you're basically doing there. I was thinking of like thinking forward your business model. When you said you're there in person, you order them, the data is hard to fake. I was wondering, is it the next step for you basically to put sensors in the manufacturing and read this data like in real time? Is there something you're thinking about talking about dealing in data or is it not necessary? Yeah, so um, this could maybe potentially very far down the future this could be something but we know that other companies are already doing it so what we rather believe is and it actually came a bit from where we originally came from so we built a tool or a digital audit software that will help us perform audits at scale because we're doing so many audits like not many other pharmaceutical companies in the world are or will be doing because we just audit on behalf of so many other pharmaceutical companies so we really developed a software that allows you to prepare an audit super well to execute it really well, to analyze the data that comes from it. And this is something that we're using internally now. And we believe that with what we're building, we actually have the potential to become like an end-to-end, all-in-one audit management solution that we can offer potentially to pharmaceutical companies so that they do the audits with our tool themselves, that we where we basically just give them our experience through a product in their own hands where they can do their own audits or just outsource the audits to us It will not matter, but there will be one data lake where all of the data basically comes together and thereby really create transparency and shareable data that is even easier to verify or put differently, harder to fake. So I think that's the direction which we're going. So we will hopefully in the future enable many companies also outside of the pharmaceutical industry to do audits at scale because also with the supply chain law, verifying information from your suppliers on site will become more and more critical in the future. The problem is if every company does audits on their own, it's not really a scalable solution because it's super expensive to do. You cannot just, uh, like SMEs, they cannot just in Germany audit all the several hundred suppliers scattered across the world. It would be way too expensive for them and they don't have the resources. But if we give them, for example, a tool at hand, which helps them to do this, a software at hand, And we are able to share that kind of data so that not everybody needs to pay for it on a single you, but the costs are being split then you can actually make audits a viable solution for every company in the world. And that's basically what we intend to do. I see. We are here to also talk about your funding round, talking about growth here. You raised 14 million US dollar, which is quite sizable for the area here, but I would also say sizable for like almost every place in Germany. How did you approach that? Because 
I've seen your investors and they are not necessarily known as a specialist in the chemical or pharma industry. How did you approach them and how did you explain this to them? And of course, later down the road, what are you going to do with the money except like for a ping pong table for the office? <laughs> yeah, funny enough, we don't even have a ping pong table. See, now yeah, I have an idea how to spend the money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think there's always enough ideas. No, but jokes aside, so I would say, actually, I was a bit surprised in the beginning. You don't have that many VC funds, I would say, in Europe who are very much sector agnostic. I think you have it for many B2C sectors like, I mean, e-commerce obviously is a big, a big one. Direct to consumer, you have many VCs who are experienced in this, but you don't have that many venture capital companies who are really focused on pharma, for example. You have a few biotech companies, but and I think, I think very similar for deep tech, I think there's also not so much. So basically what we try to do very early on is to get investors on board who can help us on different ends. So one is obviously venture capital. It's just a large amount of money um, that you can get with help, with access to other of their portfolio companies, to lots of expertise, a good network, especially when it comes to the next funding round. So that's what we look for when, we, when we're looking for institutional or venture capital investor. At the same time, however, we also took on uh, seasoned business angels who came from the industry, so either from chemicals or from the pharmaceutical industry. And so, yeah, basically, that's what we looked for when we composed our investor list. And we said we wanted a bit of both so that we make sure we have expertise in how to build a company, and how to scale a company, but also somebody who can help us do faster learnings when it comes to the pharmaceutical industry. Because, of course, Florian and myself, we have a super great the pharma expert team in the company, but we both are not pharmacists or quality people ourselves. Florin is a, a mechanical engineer and I'm a, a business person. So as you can imagine, um, yeah, getting this kind of expertise for us was actually very helpful and uh, also in hindsight, a very smart choice. I see. See, amongst your founders, there's some well-known names like Comparian, KFW, so the government, Rheingau Founders, APX, also known as Axel Springer and Porsche, Cherry Ventures, HV Capital. I noticed there's no international investor. Why? And since you have a location in Barcelona, would it make sense like in the next round? Yeah, so it was actually very funny. It was quite a competitive process, especially the last funding round. And uh, when we picked an investor, we really valued the collaboration also with the people because we believe that the big road still lies ahead of us and what we were looking for is for somebody um, where we know we're going to be a significant part of their portfolio which means they're willing to invest also time in us right we don't just want to be like a tiny ticket of a huge fund that was important to us we really valued the people who we work with like do they have do they share the same spirit the same energy level like we do do they have a good reputation when it comes to follow on funding rounds right especially when it comes to series b so we believe that's hopefully when we're going to be onboarding also an international investor that can actually help us with the challenges that we might be facing when we're there. So today, a big part of our business is still playing in Europe. Uh, so the customers that we have mainly are from Europe. There's not so much support that we need in terms of uh, hopping over the pond, for example, to the US. But this might, of course, change with the next funding round. So it's really like, uh, I think you always pick your investor based on how they can you support you on a certain part of your journey. And then when that journey is over, the requirements basically change. So for example, when you mentioned APX, that was an accelerator that was very early on. Then uh, after the accelerator, basically we joined, uh, Cherry joined as an investor, which is a, a pre-seed uh, stage investor with a very good network. So they supported us in the early stages. And then basically uh, later, uh, now HV Capital joined, who's typically invest in Series A, so who have seen bigger companies, how they scale from, uh, for example, uh, 20 to 100 uh, people, etc. Right, And for the next investor, we're looking for somebody, obviously, who has more experience in scaling beyond that. I hope that uh, is a bit clear. That makes it clear. Since we are recording this sponsored by Invest in Hessen, can you also talk in the last part a little bit about how it was for you to be headquartered here in frankfurt what are some of the advantages disadvantages and a final question if you would have one request to political decision makers in the state what would you wish for yeah let me start with the first question so is frankfurt an advantage so maybe as an anecdote uh, when we got cherry ventures as investors on board they told us as a joke you'll get the investment if you move to berlin because you will struggle in Frankfurt. And uh, of course, I'm from Frankfurt. So Florin is from Cologne, also a family here in Frankfurt. So for me, it would have been very hard to move anyways. 
And but we thought really at that time we were convinced that it's going to work. Like Frankfurt has top talents. It's good. You have a good ecosystem here. You have pharma companies. You have good universities. You have uh, consulting companies, etc. So there's talent here. Good infrastructure, etc. And um, however, what you don't have here is capital. And I believe also a little bit the startup spirit. At least I don't really feel it uh, in Frankfurt. It's more still very many very traditional service oriented industries like consulting, banking, lawyers. That's at least been my feeling so far mainly from frankfurt and luckily enough uh, we had one of our employees we hired them of a company in barcelona that was a bit of a coincidence however then we realized that barcelona actually is a super great hub where to build the company because you have lots of talents you have it's a very international city it's a very attractive city so many people want to go i mean there's even a beach it's warm most of the time of the year and there's a very good ecosystem. They've also very international talents. So, and now, actually, our Barcelona office is much bigger than our Frankfurt office. So I would say you can be successful in Frankfurt. But I think if you grow bigger and if you really want to hire also like a lot of people, it can actually get a challenge. I would say for individual profiles, you can manage it, even though it's expensive. But if you try to scale, I believe, or at least it's been my experience, you will hit bottlenecks when it comes to talents rather early. So that was, that was it for the first question. And on the second question, if you would ask what I expect from policymakers, I think especially on the Supply Chain Act, what I mentioned earlier today, uh, if you look at how companies are handling, you see that many of them are actually struggling. Also the European Green Deal, because many elements are still very vague, which means companies know something big is going to hit them, but they don't know how it's going to hit them because many things are still quite unconcrete. It's very hard for, especially for SMEs to understand like what the implication will be. So there's lots of uncertainty. And I think what policymakers should do is to bring more clarity, even like make some rules early on, even if many things are unclear, but give them some kind of clarity of what will happen. Try it. And if the rules were not good, change the rules afterwards. But I think this is better than keeping everything open uh, because I think that's causing lots of frustration, especially on, on, on the company side. So that's one element that I would wish for. I see. So. My understanding is right now that you see a little bit difficult to be in Frankfurt because you cannot hire like really scale up startups here because there's a lack of talent. Would that be something to be addressed? So, yeah, definitely. So I think like finding the talent is one element, but it's also so I think providing the infrastructure there, but also getting people to move to Frankfurt. That's also not so easy. So we've actually had quite a few people who move from our Frankfurt office to the Barcelona office which of course I cannot understand at all. So I think it's a bigger issue, right? Because there's so many factors that come into play. I mean, if you look at it from a startup point of view, what is attractive, right? So you need capital. I think that's one element. I think this is something that you, for example, do not have so much in Frankfurt and not compared to Berlin and, and, and Munich, for example, and maybe even Düsseldorf, Cologne. Then I would say the mindset of the people, which often also starts in the university. I mean, you have WHO, which is like not too far away, but they're actually still people, men, still they end up going to Frankfurt. So I think it's the whole spirit. Like if you come to Frankfurt, you typically have more, some of the more normal jobs, I would say, not so many of these crazy jobs. And it's maybe also because it's an expensive city, I would say, but other cities are also quite expensive. So I believe it's a big challenge to crack. There's many things which are going on. Also, like Tech Quartier, for example, uh, which is a hub where they basically bring people together, uh, where they also work together on topics. But I still believe we need to do more. I think there need to be more incentives for founders to come uh, when it comes to offices on the universities. They need to teach these kind of things like how to take risks or calculated risks. The mindset, I think, needs to change. But uh, on the other hand, I think on, on bigger level, I mean, also now with uh, this has been a sustainability commission, which has been moved to Frankfurt which I think is a super global topic, uh, sustainability. Globally, and I think that Frankfurt scored to get like this big institution to Frankfurt, I think is a great success. And that might also lay, lay the foundation, for example, for potential sustainability startups, because then there might be sort of an ecosystem present. So I think this will be interesting to see. But I mean, even though you have all the banks in Frankfurt, there's not too many fintechs that came from Frankfurt, right? So the question is like, how is that really adding value or is it actually other factors? There is a lot to think about for the politicians. Thank you very much for being a guest. I would like to thank you for being a guest, for being so open and informative. And fingers crossed for your Series B funding, which I assume will come sometime this year, next year. Let's say most likely in the next 12 to 24 months. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of feeling I had as well. Thank you very much, David. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. 
You too. Bye-bye. If you are a professional looking at the European startup scene, Germany is a place you cannot miss. Fortunately for you, there is StartupRad.io, the authority on German startups. This English-only podcast brings you fresh interviews each week. Most likely, you have never heard or read anything on these startups before in English, but you will in the future. Be ahead of the curve and subscribe to StartupRad.io podcast or check for the StartupRad.io internet radio station. Check your Alexa for the StartupRad.io skill as well.